Hello, everyone, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and oh, man, do we have a great show. It's another great show. It is a fantastic show. I could not be more excited. Okay, did you see this T-shirt I'm wearing? Okay, for those of you watching, I've got this T-shirt on. It says Iron Sharpens Iron, right? I specifically wore it because of the name of this book called Iron Sharpen Leadership. And I wore it because the man I'm about to interview loves talking about iron sharpening iron. It happens to be one of his favorite proverbs in all of the Bible, all right? It's pretty awesome. His name is, get ready, folks. Get ready, buckle up. If you're driving down the road listening to this podcast, just buckle up. Major General John L. Gronsky. Yes, I said that. Major General John L. Gronsky. First general on this show. I am so honored. I am so privileged. I am telling you what. Who better, ladies and gentlemen, who are listening to this show, who better to talk to you about leadership? As I have written on the blog post and I've written uh, and talked to other people, ladies and gentlemen, get ready because you're about to step into an advanced course of leadership for the next hour. So I hope you're ready, get your pencils ready, and pick up the name of the book. Yeah, pick up the book. It's called Iron Sharpen Leadership. Matter of fact, folks, let me tell you something I did. I not only picked up the book, I actually bought the Audible book, and I'm listening to the Audible book. Again, I've read this twice, and I'm listening to the Audible book in my car. Get it. It's that good. I'm just telling you, get it any way you can. Uh, he's going to change you. I promise it. I promise you he will. But before we get to him, that's what we do every week. And that's, we walk you through the four areas of your life. You know, what's interesting is that, uh, major general John L. Gronsky in his book, iron sharpen leadership talks about that. We really have to be training the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Huh? Isn't that interesting? That's the same thing that uh, command sergeant major Tom Satterley said, who is Delta force operator. It's the same thing that major Jason Van Camp said, who is a special operation forces, green beret. It's the same thing that uh, Captain John Havlick uh, said to us, who is a Navy SEAL, it's the same thing all of them say. You've got to be training those four areas every day. huh? And you know what else they kind of say? They kind of say all the same thing. If you're not growing, you're dying in all those areas because you can't, there's nothing about staying static. So, folks, let's check in on your training right now in those four areas of your life, right? And what do I mean by training? Okay, so let's take the physical. We're going to rate you on a scale of one to 10. One being your training's not very good. 10 being, man, your training could not get any better, right? And then what we're going to evaluate you, let's say physically, is like exercise, eating right, getting enough sleep, drinking enough water. If you were to put those all together and you say in the last week, how have you been doing in those areas training? And you put that all together, what kind of number would you give yourself on a scale of one to 10? Five being average. Now, here's the point. The point is not what the number is because that's just the starting point, all right? So if you're a three, I don't want you to beat yourself up because you say I'm a three. What I want you to do is go, okay, I am a three, but how can I get to a four? That's, that's the goal. And if you're a seven, how do you get to a 7.5? Or uh, uh, if you're a nine, how do you get to a 9.25, right? What, what can you do to improve? That's the point of this exercise. Not, not to beat yourself up, but to get yourself better, right? So there's your first number. Second number is the mental number, right? And what do I mean mentally? My wife has this great statement. She says, don't be a mental loafer. Don't just sit on a couch and let things come at you. You need to be an active participant in your mental training, meaning that you could read a book, right? We need to grow in our wisdom, our knowledge, our understanding of what we do, the people, how we interact with others, we need to take and be an active participant in that role. That can mean reading a book, but it can also mean doing some other things to improve our mental agility, like taking up a new instrument, learning a foreign language, uh, studying another country. There's a variety of ways that we can be active participants in our mental growth, right? In our mental training. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your mental training? Right? Now you have two numbers. Third number is the emotional training. We're, we've been in emotional training. By the way, we're generally in emotional training every day. But in the last couple of years during the pandemic, we have been in some severe emotional training, right? Daniel Goleman, a great psychologist who talked about emotional intelligence, you know, could go on and on and on about emotional intelligence, emotional quotients. We're going to break it down to just two areas. First is how well are you able to control your emotions under pressure and stress and under fire, right? That's the first one. 
The second one is how well are you able to understand and tap into the emotions of others? Now, let me just say something about this because General Gronsky says something in the book that really struck me about that. And I don't talk about it when I talk about this. But you know what the truth is? It would be very difficult to understand the emotions of someone else if you really are not aware of your own emotions. And if you're not emotionally aware, how can you expect to really be aware of someone else's emotions? So we need to really tap into that. So if you were to talk about your training emotionally, what number would you give yourself? All right, and then the fourth area is the spiritual area. And people will say, oh, I'm not spiritual. We're all spiritual, right? We really are. You know, the truth of the matter is when things go bad, we will run to something in order to try to relieve it. And whatever that thing is we run to, that's our God. And generally, you know, if you don't have yourself hooked up right, those things go bad. Right? So what, what brings you back to a place of centeredness? What brings you back to a place of peace in the midst of chaos? Is it, is it God? Is it meditation? Is it yoga? It, it, you know, is it, it, you know, General Gronsky talks about it, prayer and meditation, maybe some positive psychology. What brings you back to a state of centeredness and peace? You know, how's your faith? Right? What, what which grade would you give your training in that area? And I, I like to add not only that, but is it working for you? And if it's not, what do you need to do to change it? Right? So what number would you give your spiritual training? Those, those four areas, those four numbers are like the legs of a chair, right? If they're uneven, it would be like sitting in a chair that has uneven legs, which is bad on your posture. At the same time, if the chair legs are too low, you know what? You can't eat at a table normally, right? So we want to bring our chair legs up to the same place and, and we want to make sure that um, that we are not only have them at the right height, but also that, you know what, we have them all together. And speaking of someone who does, his name is Major General John L. Gronsky. He's a U.S. Army retired. Uh, he currently serves as a senior mentor for the U.S. Army Mission Command Training Program, an adjunct fellow for the Center for European Policy Analysis, and president of Leader Grove, a leadership development and management consulting firm. He also does a lot of speaking, by the way. Uh, and uh, he, he does a lot of speaking, and he also works with leadership. Um, I know he's currently doing things with leadership with the police departments across this country. Uh, General Gronsky served for over 40 years in the United States Army and in the National Guard and retired from the U.S. Army in 2019. He served as commanding general uh, He in, in the 28th Infantry Division, commanded the 2nd Brigade 28th Infantry Division in Ramadi, Iraq, uh, with over 5,000 U.S. soldiers, Marines, airmen, sailors, and Iraqi soldiers. He commanded a task force of 2,000 soldiers and deployed to the central region of Europe to conduct a force protection mission of U.S. installations in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, Gen General Gronkowski completed numerous military schools, including Airborne School, Ranger School, the Infantry Officers Advanced Course, and the U.S. Army War College. His military awards and decorations include the Army Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, Bronze Star, Iraq Campaign Medal, Combat Infantry Badge, Ranger Tab, and Basic Parachutist Badge. Uh, he's got his MBA from Penn State Great Valley, Master of Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College. He is a trained Six Sigma black belt, which is kind of cool. Uh, he has provided oversight and mentorship to large, diverse implement implementation teams in Fortune 500 companies. He's a highly sought-after keynote speaker. Hire him you can learn more about how to hire him by going to johngronski.com. That's J-O-H-N-G-R-O-N-S-K-I.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show and welcome for your first time ever to A New Direction, Major General John Gronkowski. Welcome, General. Hey, Jay. It's great to be with you. I love your energy. And those things you talked about right at the beginning, you know, those, those four elements of, of fitness, uh, that's worth the price of admission. So uh, I'm, I know you start every podcast talking about those things, but people need to hear it. And it's just great to be on your podcast. Uh, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you know, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to be on. It, it was just kind of a, everything fell together that you and I could do this. And and Jeffrey, uh, we just, I need to thank him as well, because he just did a great job helping us out. Let's dig right into the book. Uh, so you, you divide this book up into three sections because you have, uh, you see leadership in these three sections, a character, uh, competence and resiliency. 
So why these three uh, pieces are so important to leadership? Yeah, you know, um, uh, the book I wrote, Iron Sharp and Leadership, it's, it's really kind of like a lessons learned manual uh, from what I've learned as a, as a leader, leading large organizations uh, over the past 40 years. And what I found, you know, is I, you know, I, I'm, st I'm a student of leadership, uh, still trying to become a better leader. But what I found is that uh, my leadership philosophy, what works for me is uh, focusing on character, which I really think is the foundational element of leadership. And then leadership competencies, which I, when I talk about leadership competencies, I talk about uh, a leader providing a vision to an organization, a leader being able to communicate and, and, and develop relationships and, and a leader having the courage to make decisions. And then the third element of my leadership philosophy is resilience. So the book is really based on my leadership philosophy. It's worked for me. Uh, I, I've learned lessons uh, largely due to the mistakes I've made uh, over the last 40 years. And I just wanted to share those lessons through this book. I There's so much I want to cover in this book. I told you before the show, I've got 40 pages of notes and <laughs> there's so much I want to talk about. And I'm looking at these notes going, where do I start? I, I was thinking about it earlier. Where do I start? But, you know, I, I'm going to start with chapter one, which is called Proven Leadership Traits. And... I want to talk about self-discipline for a second because I think you make a point of saying self-discipline is sometimes easier from for some people than others. Oh yeah. And and yet we can all improve on that area, but it is fundamentally important to leadership. Why? What help us help us make that Help us help people understand. I I think I don't want to take for granted that self discipline, the importance of self discipline. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think um, we talk about self discipline enough, especially when it be, when it comes to, to to leading. But really, self discipline is important for anyone who wants to become better at whatever they're doing. And um, you know, I tell a story about. Uh, Mike Kotcher, a, a soldier I served with who was in a rocket attack in, in Afghanistan, uh, had to have his arm amputated and developed the, the self-discipline to uh, not define his life by the fact that he had an amputated arm, but he began to define his life by uh, uh, getting involved in, in physical competition. And he, uh, he, he was involved in three different Invictus games and the Invictus games were set up by Prince Harry for wounded warriors uh, to compete in. And a picture I love of Mike Kotcher is he just competed in a rowing competition with one arm, believe it or not. And this guy is ripped and he's, you know, striking that champion pose after he, he got off the row. I think he, he earned a bronze medal in, in that particular competition. But the story I tell about Mike and I think this is important because it gets into self-discipline and it also gets into caring more about others than you care about yourself. It was in the um, Invictus Games that he competed in in, in Australia. There was a, a young girl, about eight, nine years old, who was kind of following him from venue to venue as he competed. And he, he kind of noticed her shadowing him. And then he, he went over to talk to her and noticed that she was also missing an arm. She was born without an arm. Of course, Mike's arm was amputated. She was born without an arm. And so uh, obviously there was a connection there. And, and he earned a silver medal during a track event. And he invited this young girl, her name is Gemma, up on the platform with him as he received the silver medal. And then after the ceremony, he took that silver medal from around his neck and presented it to this eight-year-old girl. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with her father, even though, you know, he, he's Australian, but we stay in contact via email. And he told me that that act of kindness that Mike displayed to this young eight-year-old girl who he never met before, giving away his silver medal that he worked so hard to get, changed the trajectory of her life. And now she's uh, uh, with one arm. She's a swimmer, a competitive swimmer. She's doing fantastic. Her confidence has really soared since that uh, uh, connection with Mike Kotcher. And it, it just goes to show how a leader, by doing something small, at least something seemingly small in your mind as a leader, 
has has so much of an impact on on someone you know that's following you. And I think it's a great story. But again, Mike would never have gotten to that point without the self discipline to overcome that wound he have of having an amputated arm, but still having the courage to compete in the Invictus Games. You know, it's it it's that's a beautiful. You, by the way, there are many awesome stories in this book, uh, Iron Sharpened Leadership. Uh, it, many stories like that. The, the story also does exemplify the other two pieces that you talk about in this chapter, and that's dignity and respect, because yeah. he showed dignity and respect to Gemma, but then also it showed his selflessness, which you talk about throughout the book as being character traits that are important to leadership. Maybe talk about those two real quick. Yeah, I, I think, I, again, Character and you know integrity are foundational to leadership. You cannot lead unless you have strong character and and strong values. And and uh, you know as as you mentioned, you you have to show people that you lead the dignity and respect. You know we talk a lot about toxic leadership, and I think it's impossible to be labeled a toxic leader. You know somebody who's a caustic leader if you treat those you lead with dignity and respect. And if you treat people in that way, uh, you can even fire somebody mm. in a dignified and respectful manner. So, so treating people with dignity and respect doesn't mean as a leader that you don't hold people to the standards because standards are important. And we do expect high performance if we're going to have a high performing organization. But by, by doing those type of things and being a character based leader, somebody with integrity. And then you mentioned care. And 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 I think uh, you know that that is one of the elements of, of of character is caring for those you lead. And I say you know leaders have to care more about those they lead than they care about themselves. And let me tell you something, Jay. That is easy to say, very very hard to do. I think the only people who are naturally hardwired to care about somebody else be, uh, more than they care about themselves are parents. I think parents could naturally care more about their children than they care about themselves. But as a leader, you've got to be able to do that. And, um, you know, uh, people say, well, you know, that, that's that's kind of risky. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, not everybody should be a leader because leadership is froth with risk. Right. And, and I, I, you know, I, I think everybody could learn how to become a better leader. But, you know, some people just uh, if you're if you're not willing to give that uh, care more about the welfare of those you lead than you care about your own welfare, then you should probably step aside and let somebody else take on that leadership role. I, I could not agree more. I, I, I think it's, it's an element that misses that we miss in leadership is the caring. And, and that leads me into the three V's, which is chapter two, the three V's to achieve. And you have three B's, you have vulnerability, values, and vision. And it's that vulnerability piece that I don't think we, consider when it comes to leadership, but you, it, that's a real, you, again, that's another thing you talk about throughout the book. Talk about the importance of vulnerability in leadership. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, I think vulnerability has started to be talked about more now, but I really think it's a, a essential element of being a, a resilient leader. And when I talk about vulnerability, I talk about a leader having the courage to leave their comfort zone, to try new things, to actually listen to people that you wouldn't be normally, uh, you know, uh, disposed to listen to. So that means uh, setting up a diverse team around you. And then, you know, it, it's easy for a leader, me, you know, if, if I kind of have something in common with you, Jay, it's easy for me to ask you your opinion, you know, but, but if, you know, we, we kind of have divergent views all the time, sometimes I kind of neglect to see what's on your mind and what your suggestions and recommendations are. So again, by leaving your comfort zone means engaging people who are who are different than you to hear what those ideas are. And then another element of, of vulnerability that I, I like to talk about is leaders having the courage to ask their followers what their opinions are and what their recommendations are. Because if I'm a leader and I'm going to ask one of my followers, what do you think? How do you think we should handle this? I'm, I'm actually telling them that, hey, although I'm the leader, I don't have all the answers. So you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable as a leader, to let your followers know that I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm your leader, but you may be smarter than me in this particular area. And I want to hear 
what you have to say. And then the third element of vulnerability is I, I believe leaders uh, need to allow themselves to be vulnerable by sharing stories with their followers. But what kind of stories? The stories leaders need to share with their followers are about the time that leader has you know, taken a swing with the bat but missed. The time that leader has made a mistake. The, the time that leader has tried something and they failed at it. Because, you know, when we're in a leadership position, a lot of times our followers think that everything we touched turned to gold. That, man, I'm a leader. So, you know, that guy's a leader. So they probably never made a mistake. And we know as leaders, Jay, that nothing could be farther from the truth. We've all made mistakes. So by a leader allowing themselves to be vulnerable, to share those stories about mistakes they've made and feelings they've had with their followers, you're inspiring your followers to know that, hey, if they make a mistake, they could, they could bounce forward from that. You know, it's not the end of the world. And you could get over that because we all make mistakes. We all face adversity. And, and to allow yourself to be vulnerable as a leader in those ways I just mentioned, I think is extremely important. His name is Je Major General John L. Gronsky. The book is entitled Iron Sharpen Leadership. And you're listening to him here on A New Direction. Folks, two great, uh, I have two great sponsors. One is Epic Physical Therapy. Whether recovering from injury, surgery, suffering everyday aches and pains, having difficulty performing activities of daily living, maybe you're a professional athlete or an athlete looking to improve how you do your sport, listen, the elite team at Epic Physical Therapy will provide you with a customized treatment plan tailored to you. With their experience at rehabbing young athletes to elite professional athletes, they understand the need to treat the body as a functional whole, not just your symptoms or your injury. So when you're ready for your epic relief, you're ready for your epic recovery, and you're ready for your epic results, go to epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors, for over 35 years, they have been serving the world and helping them meet, find their dream and their dream home. So you know what? They do that because, well... It's about the relationships. It's about being vulnerable. They know the stories and they tell their story too. And they want to help you. So when you're ready to sell your home or buy your home, start with Linda Craft at Team Realtors. You can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction with Major General John L. Gronsky in his book, Iron Sharpened Leadership. And if uh, you are just tuning in to the show, first of all, thank you. Thank you to everybody out there who's tuning in and watching and listening on all the varieties of different ways. And I also want to thank the radio stations that are carrying the show across the United States. And uh, we just appreciate you. And tell your tell your program director of the radio station that you're listening to, man, we really love the show and we want to hear more because we would love to do that for you. And uh, so thank you. And also, if you're listening by podcast, you know, regardless of what podcast you're listening to, why don't you give us a like, uh, give us five stars, and why don't you give us a positive review, right? Because that helps us out a bunch. So thank you for doing that. Uh, we're, let's let's talk, let's jump to chapter four, character is the foundation of leadership. You said that earlier, but uh, let's talk about character because it's, it is something that we can... I, I, you're not just born. I don't know that you're just born with it. I mean, we can always be working on our character, right? Oh, absolutely. Right. So, I mean, why, why is this the foundation for you when it comes to leadership? Yeah. You know, first of all, I want to say this, Jay, that none of our, none of us are saints. You know, the, <laughs> the only man who was a perfect man lived 2000 years ago. Right. right. And, and um, you know, when I talk about character, you know, now and then, uh, you know, I, I've had failings. Every, everybody has failings. Everybody has sin. So I'm not talking about being a perfect person, but I'm talking about understanding what your own personal core values are. And, uh, you know, organizations have values. And I, I think if you're in an organization that has organizational values and you're part of the leadership team there, when you're making a business decision or an, an organizational decision, you need to take a look at what those organizational values are and factor those values into your decision-making process. You know, how many business leaders really do that? Uh, and when it comes to making personal decisions, I believe everybody has to go on an introspective journey and really decide what are their three to five 
personal core values. You know, when your back is against the wall, what are the values you're really going to stand for? And I remember when I was in my mid 20s, I was at a dinner, I was listening to a speaker and it was a great speaker. She was talking about her personal core values and how those personal core values helped her become a success in business. And as I was driving home from that dinner, again, you know, 25, 26 years old, I was thinking to myself, wow, that was inspiring. And then I thought, if anybody asked me what my personal core values were, would I be able to, you know, rattle them off three to five things? And I thought, no, I wouldn't be able to. And so I went on an introspective journey. It took me about six months. I really thought long and hard about what my personal core values were, and I developed them. And they turned out to be service, persistence, integrity, commitment, and energy. And, and I try to live my life that way. And when I make personal decisions, I try to factor those values into the personal decisions I make. So the point is, if you as an individual haven't thought long and hard about what your personal core values are, how are you ever going to factor them into your decision-making process when you're making personal decisions? And I think if we keep those values uh, as something to orient on, we could live a, a better life from a personal perspective and also from from a business perspective. I, by the way, I love your core values that it's an acronym for SPICE. Exactly. It I, happens to be. I mean, that, it wasn't intentional, but that's what it turned out. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But yeah. it's kind of like, right, because it's kind of like the spice of life. I mean, it's kind of like it just it adds flavor, right? It's your core values add flavor to yeah. whatever you're doing. I, and I thought that was fantastic. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I don't know if he did it intentionally. I said, I, I guess is it kind of worked out that way. But that that's really, really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of worked out nicely. And uh and I guess, you know, God just directed me that way. And, 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 uh, but again, I try to make decisions based on those values and live by those values. So I, I mine is vapor. Okay. Yeah. Vulnerability, authenticity, uh, passion, optimism, and resilience. I love it. Yeah. I, I just feel like those are the, the five things for me that I have to live by. Yeah. Yeah. That and, and, and see, that's the point, Jay, is, you know, Understanding what your what your core values are is a very personal journey you have to go on. And right. So for those listening, for those listening who haven't gone on that journey, I certainly encourage no matter what age you are to go on that journey and really think long and hard about what are those three to five values that are important to you. Yeah, I. Yeah, and by the way, it didn't come out vapor. It it, it that wasn't the way it started because my very first one was authenticity because I just am such a. I just believe that being authentically who you are and who you were created to be yeah. is absolutely fundamentally important. Mm -hmm. And I believe that passion, that if you don't do things with passion, you're not really living out your purpose. Yeah. Right. I mean, so it didn't, it didn't start out vapor, probably like it didn't start out spice for you. I, that, I think that's my point here. It, 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 it kind of came out and then all of a sudden I put, I mixed the letters up. I go, oh, it spells vapor, which by the way, is kind of cool. So I was like, <laughs> well, that was kind of how it worked. You, you, I live in North Carolina and coach K is not always the most popular person in North Carolina because we have three schools right where I live here in the research jungle park, NC state, uh, North university of North Carolina and Duke, of course, but you talked, you had an interview with him, I guess. And he talked about character being extremely important to winning championships. Yeah, you know, uh, and 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 actually, it wasn't me who had the interview with him. A friend of mine did, and uh, and I and I got this from from him that you know when he was interviewing Coach K uh, about the importance of you know how to be a leader, you know what what Coach K's leadership philosophy was, and and Coach K was really focused on character. And my friends uh, said to Coach K, he said, he said, Coach, he said, what does character have to do with with winning a basketball game. And and uh, Coach Kraszewski said, you know, character has nothing at all to do with winning a basketball game. However, it has everything to do with winning a championship. And I thought, man, is that powerful. And and can't we use that in our life? That, you know, if if and you know, if you're not a character-based leader, if you're a toxic leader, Yes, you are going to win now and then. But if you want to live a championship style life, that's where character comes in. 
if you know if you want to win big over the long term that's where character comes in that is the difference you know cuz we see in the news some tyrannical people win you know but right. again they won't have long term success and let, i i believe you won't have long term success unless you're a character based leader yeah i i I, I, when I read that, I was like, I, I had never given that thought. I, I never yeah. had that thought in my head. And then once you said, I was like, wow, that makes, just makes complete sense. So I'm going to jump to chapter six, what leadership is all about. Um, I'm going to, by the way, when you go through this book, Iron Sharpened Leadership, I just want to say this to the people listening. Major General John Gronsky here has a actions and a spiritual uh, element that at the end of each chapter, and he literally has actions that you can take at the end of these chapters that you can, they're practical um, and pragmatic um, things that you can do immediately to start back on, get on your journey in whatever he's talking about in that chapter. Um, both, you know, it's physical, mental, it's emotional, and then there's a spiritual piece too that's connected as well. Uh, and, th and that's what makes this book really, really special, by the way, uh, available at Amazon bookstores near you um, in, in all formats. Um, in chapter six, I want to talk about uh, what leadership is all about. And you start with a quote at the end, beginning of every chapter. And this comes from the Infantry Journal in 1948. It says, no man is a leader until his appointment is ratified in the minds and hearts of his men. And you have a leadership lesson by uh, a Marine by the name of Michael Burghardt. And I would love it if you would share that story and explain what leadership is really all about. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, you know th th this is a great, inspiring story, and I'll I'll try to be as brief as I could. Uh, but uh, bottom line, September nineteenth, uh, two thousand and five, Ramadi, Iraq. I was a brigade commander there, and I I had one of our lieutenants conducting a, a mounted patrol. He was his patrol. It had four up armored Humvees, and up armored Humvee is a is a wheeled armored combat vehicle. And as he was conducting this patrol, he began to get small arms fire from insurgents near a railroad bed. And this lieutenant, his name was Lieutenant Dooley. He began to uh, maneuver his four up armored Humvees toward that insurgent position so they could uh, make contact with him and destroy them. And as he was maneuvering in his up armored Humvee, a roadside bomb, subsurface roadside bomb detonated underneath his Humvee, instantly killing Lieutenant Dooley and the two soldiers in that Humvee with him. Sergeant Egan from the Philadelphia area and uh, Specialist Fernandez, who was from the, the Reading, Pennsylvania area. Three of them killed instantly. Uh, very, very, very sad. Anyway, when we would have attacks like this occur, and we had plenty of them because during a, one year we conducted operations there, we had over a thousand IED attacks against my brigade, believe it or not. I mean, it's phenomenal. And um, I, I sent, uh, we had uh, Gunnery Sergeant Michael Burkhart was the, who was the explosive ordnance disposal team leader, went down to that site with two young Marines, and they were going to conduct a post-blast analysis to determine the tactics, techniques, procedures the insurgents were using so we could try to prevent these attacks from happening again in the future. And when Gunny Burkhart got down there with the two young Marines, it was chaotic. The soldiers were securing the scene. To add to the chaos, there were two reporters from the Omaha World Herald newspaper there. There were embedded reporters. So anyway, Gunny Burkhardt gets down there, sees the destroyed up-armored Humvee, sees a crater near that up-armored Humvee, about four feet in diameter, a couple feet deep, makes an, an assumption that that's where that roadside bomb that destroyed that Humvee was placed, jumps down in the crater, take a closer look. As soon as he did that, he realized he made a mistake because he could see in the dirt in front of him two artillery shells with red detonation cord running in the nose. It was a, a roadside bomb that an insurgent had placed there. So he took his K-bar knife, cut the red de detonation cord to neutralize that roadside bomb. He didn't see a third artillery shell in the dirt behind him in that crater. An insurgent was off in the distance, hit a button on a detonation device. That artillery shell exploded, knocked Gunny Burkhardt about 15 feet into the air, lands on a dirt road, unconscious, pants soaked with blood, our soldiers call in a medevac helicopter right away, go up to him, start, you know, they cut his pants off, start tending to his wounds. After a few minutes, Burkhart regains consciousness. The soldiers couldn't believe it. And, and he's laying there and he asks the soldiers if he has both of his legs because he had no, no sensation from the waist down. And they assured him he had both of his legs. They continue to work on him. A couple of minutes later, he gets a tingling sensation in his legs. 
he tells the soldiers he wants to stand up. The soldiers couldn't believe it. This guy had just gotten blown up. And so he struggles to his feet. He's standing there, the soldiers around him. The medevac helicopter comes in, lands on the ground behind them. The soldiers point to the stretcher uh, on the ground in front of them and say, hey, Gunny, we've got to, you know, we got to put you on the stretcher and carry you to that helicopter. And he looks at the soldiers and he says, I'm not going to have you carry me to that helicopter on the stretcher. I'm going to walk there under my own power because I don't want the insurgents to have the pleasure of seeing me being carried to the helicopter. And he's, he, he says that he raises his, his uh, hand into the air and gives the insurgents, which I will call a one finger salute. Now, I think everybody knows what that means. The, re the reporter the reporter from the Omaha World Herald take, takes a picture of him standing there, uh, groin protector, you know, in, in front of his uh, private area there, no pants on, finger thrown up into the air, soldiers around him. You can see the helicopter in the background. That picture became an iconic picture of the Iraq war. But what is the leadership point of the story? And the reason I tell this story and the reason um, I, I think it's important the leadership point of this story is, remember I told you he had two young Marines with him that day. Right. He knew he was going to have to recover from his wounds. He knew with all the roadside bomb attacks we were getting that those two young Marines were going to have to be out there probably later on that day neutralizing roadside bombs. The reason he wanted to walk to that helicopter instead of being carried there had nothing at all to do with what he thought the insurgents were thinking. He wanted to walk to that helicopter so he would not shatter the confidence of those two young Marines. So the leadership point is, even after getting blown up 10 minutes earlier, his main concern was not with his own wounds. His main concern was with those two young Marines who he was leading. And isn't that what leadership is all about? And we talked about that, looking out for the welfare of those you lead rather than your own welfare. And that's exactly what Gunny Burkhart exemplified that day. And, and that's why I like to tell that story. That's, I read that story. I, I had to reread it again because I was, I was laughing because I could just yeah. see, I could just, because I, I have friends who are Marines, right? Yeah. By the way, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. Okay, that just, just that, that doesn't exist. I've been told that countless times by my friends. There's just no such thing. Uh, they, they may be, quote unquote, have retired at the end of their name, but they're still a Marine. Right. And true, and and uh, I, I was just thinking about them. Go, yeah, that's exactly what Jimmy would have done. That's exactly <laughs> what he would have done. You know, that's what Bob would have done. He would have done the same thing. You know, I I could just see it. I and I just it was a great story. But it was truly the surprise in that lesson was not. I, I thought it was going to be resiliency, but it, it and it is. But the big point is that he cared so much about making sure that those other two young Marines were in there, that their mental emotional state was not shaken. Yeah. And, and you know, Jay, th think about this. I mean, as leaders, we face adversity almost every day in whatever organization we're leading to some degree. And, and, you know, sometimes things get tough on us. And the point is, as a leader, you can't be thinking I'm, I'm, you know, and figuratively I'll use this, you know, you can't be thinking I'm cold, you know, I, I I'm hungry, you know, I, I, I'm shivering. Right. No, you, you've got to show those you're leading that, you know what, I've got the resiliency to overcome this. And because I do, you have the resiliency to overcome this. Right. And, you know, I might be cold, I might be hungry, I might be weak, but I'm going to take care of you before I take care of myself. And that's the essence of leadership. Yeah, we underestimate the modeling of our behavior, don't we, when it comes to leadership? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know what? Uh, the other thing I learned in my 40 years of leading soldiers and also leading teams in the business sector is the people you lead are always watching you. You know, you could, you could put down in writing your leadership philosophy is, or you could verbally give some guidance about behaviors you're looking for. But those you lead are going to be watching to see, you know, how do you adhere to your own guidance? behaviors that you're looking for, do you exemplify those behaviors? And your followers are always watching and your actions speak so much louder than, uh, louder than your words do. That's beautiful. I, I, I have a friend who has since passed away and he, he gave me a plaque that says, you know, uh, you know, walk the talk. 
And he yeah. used to say to me, a walk talks louder than a talk talks. Exactly. And uh, I and I I keep it with me all the time as a reminder that I need to always be doing better with my walk. Yeah. Right. We I mean we all do. I mean I, I'm 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 not saying because I'm not perfect. Right. right. I, I need to be better, but I, I have to understand that I'm a man of many words. I mean, it's what I do for a living. I speak, I I write, I I do the show. You know, I mean, it's it's and I coach, you know, I coach people. And so I, I'm a man of words, but I really got to pay attention to my walk. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's true. And 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 followers will be watching and 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 it's important. You know, Jay, if if I may, uh, sure. you know, uh I, I think we we might be ending soon. I I, I do want to talk just a little bit about the title of that book, Iron Sharpened Leadership. And you mentioned at the beginning. Sure. It, it's based on really one of my favorite Bible verses, Proverbs 27, 17, which reads, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And and I just want to talk for a minute about that and, and why I think that's important to leadership. Uh, and, and, and that verse is so powerful, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So that speaks to the fact that we're not an island. We need other people. We need other people to help make us, us stronger. And at the same token, uh, we're put on this earth to help other people become stronger too. So I like to say as leaders, as we're trying to reach a hand up to find a mentor, to find a coach for ourselves so we could become stronger, we could become better leaders, we have to reach a hand down to find people who are maybe not as talented as we are, maybe a little bit weaker than we are, to give, reach our hand down and give them a hand up to help them become stronger leaders, to help them become stronger people. So that that's what I believe that Bible verse is all about, is iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's all about working together as a team so we could all become stronger together. You and I are going to have to have some extra talk about iron sharpens iron because I, I, it's one of my favorites as well. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt for a reason. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love it. Yeah, but we're going to have to talk about that. Did I tell you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, how great uh, Major General John Gronsky is? Yeah, he's that good. And the book is entitled Iron Sharpen Leadership. Get your copy available everywhere. You're listening to him here on A New Direction. Hey, folks, um, <laughs> excuse me. I have... Two great sponsors. I've talked about them over and over and over again ad nauseum, probably for some of you. Epic Physical Therapy offers the most advanced top of the line equipment, including the Alter G anti gravity treadmill, the Normatec compression sleeves, Game Ready, which is my favorite. Um, listen, they're trade and certified in the most comprehensive cutting edge treatments available. Things like blood flow restriction therapy, dry needling, cupping. That's just a few. You know what? When you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, and your epic results, don't look any further. Start where the professionals go. Go with Epic Physical Therapy. That's EpicPT.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors. Listen, there is a reason why their past clients say they are the legends of customer service. Do you know why? Because they care. And it's because they establish relationships with them and they maintain those relationships because they understand that P&Ls are not about profits and losses. It's about people and lives, especially when it comes to real estate. They understand that your home is full of memories and they want to take care of those memories because they're as precious to you, them as they are to you. And so when you're ready to start your real estate journey, whether that's selling your home or buying your next home, start with Linda Craft and Team Realtors. You can learn my, more by going to lindacraft.com. It's L-I-N-D-A. C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction with uh, Major General John Gronsky. The book uh, is entitled Iron Sharpened Leadership. And um, I, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am because I feel like I'm sitting at the general's feet and I just get to <laughs> absorb uh, all of this. And I feel, I feel bad because... Like I, I like going, I feel like I'm getting so much more out of this and I'm trying to do this because I want to help everybody out there, but I feel so selfish right now because I'm so enjoying uh, every moment that I'm having with you and, and, and the time is running uh, so fast. Uh, so uh, let's get back to it. Uh, chapter 14, leading with a purpose. Um, let's talk about uh, how important um, shared purpose and finding meaning for your people is. You know, Jay, I'm so happy you brought that up. 
because I've been thinking a lot lately about people with, you know, struggling with post-traumatic stress, right. uh, the fact that there's a, a suicide crisis in our country. You know, over the last 10 years, more veterans have committed suicide, about 73,000 in the last 10 years, than have, have been killed during the Vietnam War, uh, around 58,000 during the Vietnam War. I mean, it, it's an incredible epidemic for our veterans and then for other people as well. And, and um, you know, I was reading something the other day. I'm reading a book. The name of the book is River of Doubt. It's, it's about uh, Teddy Roosevelt's expedition down into the Amazon River Basin in South America. And he had his, his son Kermit with him on that expedition back in 1913. And there was a passage in that book that made me think about how to help people struggling with post-traumatic stress and why purpose is so important. And there was a passage in there that talked about Kermit and it talked about how he's, he was only in his 20s then, but it talked about even up to that point, he was struggling with depression in his life and how at points during that expedition, when he had a purpose, he just dug into that purpose and, and he wasn't depressed and he, and, he, and he felt fulfilled. And then as it turned out, I think it was in 1942 at, in his mid fifties, he ended up taking his own life uh, when he was serving in the army in Alaska. And, and, and I thought to myself, you know, one of the best things we could focus on uh, when we're helping people uh, struggling with post-traumatic stress is to help them understand what their purpose in life is now. Mm. You know, if, if, if it's a military veteran, you know, they had a purpose while they were serving in the military and they might come out, they might be retired or they might have been medically retired or, or just left the military and now they're struggling perhaps with what their purpose is now that they're no longer serving in uniform. And I think the more we could work with veterans to, and, and what they're looking for is not a handout, they're looking for a hand up. And, and, and to help them find their purpose, I think that's so important. And, and same with, with, with leadership. Leaders have to help their followers understand what the overarching purpose of their unit, their organization, their team is. And I remember when I was over in Iraq, you know, uh, commanding 5,000 soldiers and Marines, uh, every day could feel like Groundhog Day in a way. Uh, you know, a tremendous amount of, of, of various attacks, a very volatile and dangerous situation. And I was really clear whenever I would talk to soldiers and Marines to help them understand what our purpose was, what I believed our purpose was that I would share with them. I believed our purpose when we were conducting those combat operations in Iraq. And I would tell them this, the reason we're here putting our own lives at risk, the reason your buddies are putting their lives at risk, and some of them have, have been killed, is to keep our families and friends in America safer back home. And to me, that was the overarching purpose of why we were there. And I tried to convey that to do those that I led. And I think if leaders could help convey that overarching purpose to those that they're leading within their organization, it, 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 it helps people embrace something larger than themselves. And I think that's very important. Well, it is important, and it, it's important for, uh, first of all, 22 veterans commit suicide a day is what we know on average, and it yeah. is a tragic number, and uh, part of it, and excuse me, General, for saying this, but part of it is I just don't feel like we do a very good job once we take them out of the field, helping them transition into, into some sort of civilian life where they do have a purpose. And that they do have a place where they understand that they're needed, wanted, and that they have a lot of uh, skills and opportunity to give. Uh, I have had the fortune and privilege to work with a number of our young men and women who have served and help them try to find another career after uh, after they've served. And uh, I just believe that we just could do a better job helping them find that purpose, uh, I believe. And if you're somebody, uh, there are places, people, I'm just going to encourage you to volunteer uh, that you can to just help people uh, like these veterans, help them find a place because uh, you don't know what kind of service. But I'm also going to say this about people who retire. Um, retirement is, if you do not have a purpose after retirement, you will die quickly. Um, and that's just a fact. Um, I'm speaking now as a psychological professional. Um, that's the reason why. And we have to find that purpose. Uh, 
And that's absolutely critically important. Matter of fact, you have a quote from Colin Powell, who famously has said, optimism is a force multiplier. And it is absolutely true that when we have purpose that provides some optimism, and if we can apply that purpose with passion and optimism, we we become an unstoppable force. And as you talk about Peter Drucker, who was, I guess he was near 90, uh, was still thinking about, you know, what his next book was going to be. And yeah. I think that's a pr critical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think when Peter Drucker was in his 90s, somebody asked him what his, what, what the favorite book of his that he wrote was. And he said, it's the next book I'm going to write. And, and I thought that was just an incredible attitude. And then, as you mentioned, Colin Powell, who unfortunately passed away uh, about a week and a half ago, what a, what a great leader he was. And he talked about optimism being a force multiplier, just said. And I, the way I define optimism is a leader be, believing and convincing those they lead that tomorrow is going to be better than today. Mm. But that doesn't just come with saying that. Uh, the leader has to put together an action plan that's believed by the followers. So they truly believe we're on a path to make tomorrow better than today. You know, it's not just about saying it. It's about having a plan to get there. And, and I think that's the difference between uh, uh, a leader with rose colored glasses on and a leader who could set a and, and a path forward that's believable to their followers. So you could have success in whatever team you're leading. And, and Colin Powell was right on when he said optimism is, is a force multiplier. That's beautiful. Uh, let's move to section three, resilience. And uh, chapter 32 uh, is called spiritual fitness. And you have a story that I laughed out loud. And I think my wife thought I was crazy because I laughed so hard about um, a brigade, a September 2005 Ramadi, uh, Iraq brigade, and you had a brigade chaplain and you had a little story. Why don't we talk about that and uh, that story and, and resilience and spiritual fitness? Yeah, I think the story you're referring to is, is we, I, I was, you know, out there, uh, you know, doing battlefield circulation. I, I was in my up armored Humvee with, with a few other up armored Humvees, uh, in my personal security detachment. And I had the chaplain, my brigade chaplain riding with me in the Humvee that, that day. And, you know, we go out to see a unit and we, we go through the city of Ramadi and there were people out there and, and seem things seem somewhat normal for as normal as it could have appear to be in Ramadi in 2005. And then on the way back to our Ford operating base, not a soul on the street. Nobody was on the street and it was midday and, and, you know, no cars, nothing. And we were experienced enough to know that when you see the uh, operational tempo of the city slow down like that, you know that there's probably going to be insert, an insurgent attack. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of like our spider senses are up and, and we're a little bit tense, you know, just, just observing a little bit of the, the banter that we usually have inside of the vehicle stop, you know, settle down. And the chaplain finally spoke up and he said, fear not, God is with us. And we had, uh, you know, an up armored Humvee, there's a gunner's compartment and, and the gunner is somewhat exposed up there. And the gunner heard the chaplain announce that and he yelled down to the chaplain, chaplain, God might be down there with you, but he's not up here with me. And about five seconds later, an insurgent fires a rocket propelled grenade and it hits the protective shield around where that gunner was and it just kind of bounces off skips up into the air and you know uh, you know meters away from him explodes in the air and doesn't harm anybody and the 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 gunner you know called right down to the chaplain without missing a beat he said i stand corrected chaplain god just arrived <laughs> and and uh and, you know, that also speaks to the fact that humor is important, you know, as a leader, uh, you know, humor is important and, and humor kind of cuts down on tense situations and on stress. And uh, it's, it's just that type of humor that the soldier who was like a specialist, you know, an E4, you know, without missing a beat, he just called right down and, and everybody just broke up and laughed and, uh, 
it just kind of end, ended the, the, the stress to a degree. There is something about spiritual resilience uh, that it's hard to explain. I, I tell people all the time it's very difficult, but I, I do believe that the spiritual element, um, I remember Major Jason Van uh, Camp I went on to the show, and he talked about the spiritual element of having heart and going, you know, the ability that there's something inside you, there is a spirit inside you that uh, helps you go on. Uh, in the midst of circumstances. And uh, I, I feel like that was part of this as well. And that when we're connected, uh, in my case, in your case, God, um, that when we're connected, there is something that goes beyond ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, Jay, I, I think the spiritual element is really about believing that there's something out there bigger than yourself. Mm. You know, there's something in the universe bigger than yourself, and and uh, just just to have that belief, and and also to have that faith. Uh, you know, we talked about optimism, and you need an action plan to really be an optimist. But you, I, I believe you also need faith as well, and just believing. I believe. I, I I believe that there's a higher power looking over me, and there's a higher power that is going to. Uh, certain things are going to happen. And you think maybe what happened to you is, is really something bad, and you, it turns out being something good. Um, and and I, I think you just have to have that faith and belief that there's a higher power out there, and there's something bigger than them, than ourselves that you have to work toward. And I can't explain it. You know, I'm not a theologian, right, right. I'm not a minister, uh, but but I'm a believer. Yeah, me too. Uh, listen, we've been on an hour. Wow. It's gone fast. It went quickly. <laughs> it went quickly. Uh, tell people what you've got going on and how they can get a hold of you. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned my book. And yes, you could get my book on Amazon, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Unison Books. But I also have an e-commerce site. It's store, S-T-O-R-E, dot leadergrove, dot com. And, and if people ordered a book from my e-commerce site, I'll sign the book. And, and and send it off to you. And if you want to sign a copy of my book, that's the way to get it. Otherwise, you get it through other sources. It's also on Kindle uh, and it's Audible. So, you know, you could list, you could learn from that book in, in a variety of ways. My email address, uh, john at johngronsky.com. My website, johngronsky.com. I have a great deal of free leadership resources on my website, a blog, uh, link to my YouTube site, you could register for a free leadership email I, I send out periodically. So all kinds of great leadership resources there. And if anybody just has a question, you know, just, just email me. I love to interact with people. Follow me on a myriad of different social um, uh, networking sites, social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. You could find me. Uh, go to my website. You'll see all those different sites listed there. But I love to interact with people and anything I could do to help or assist, I'm always glad to do. His name is Major General John L. Gronsky. The book, Iron Sharpen Leadership, and he was awesome, wasn't he? <laughs> Listen, folks, you know what? I tell you every week, you are in control of two things, regardless of your circumstances, your attitude and your effort. Take control of those two things because it doesn't matter. Those are always within your control. I'm going to be back next week with another great guest. It's going to be another great book. It's going to be another great show, as I say to you every week. And you know what that is. Ciao, everybody. <laughs>